So good morning and welcome to Upskill Works uh, Forum on the Clean Energy Workforce of the Future. Uh, I'm Peter Beard and I lead the Greater Houston Partnerships Upskill Houston Initiative, which is an employer-led initiative that really tries to build the talent pipeline for the key industry sectors here in the Houston and Gulf Coast region. Uh, and it really takes kind of the employer leadership because they're subject matter experts uh, to help develop that pipeline. And so we have a collaboration of employers, of education partners, community partners, and the public workforce system, all to kind of help do that. And obviously, as we think about kind of clean energy and the transition that's occurring, it becomes critically important. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors for the Upskill Works Forum series. It includes Accenture, the Houston Community College, Texas Mutual Insurance, and Winstead PC, along with Burns and McDonald, Lone Star College, Mustang Cat, San Jacinto College, Silver Eagle Distributors, uh, and Worley. And finally, HCA Houston Healthcare and Ineos. Uh, these are critical partners both on my Upscale Houston Executive Committee, but also for the generous support that allows for events like this to take place. Uh, for our virtual audience, we're glad you could join us this morning. Uh, I'd like to introduce Andre Alcantar, who served as, on the Texas Workfor Workforce Commission from 2008 to 2018 and was appointed the chair of TWC in 2012. Currently, he provides strategic advice and counsel to key stakeholders across the workforce sp system spectrum, including the Texas Association of Community Colleges and Houston Community College. And it's in that role, it's, uh, we're privileged to have him here is to represent Houston Community College, and I'm gonna turn it over to Andre to kind of take it from there. Andre? Morning, everyone. Morning. What a great morning uh, here in Houston, and what an honor to be here. This is gonna be an exciting panel. I'm really looking forward to it, and I'm privileged to uh, introduce this panel on behalf of Houston Community College. Really proud of partnering up with a partnership. Today's Upskill Works Forum, the Clean Energy Workforce of the Future, is, uh, is timely, it's essential, and it really addresses uh, many of the issues that are happening in the economy. As many of us know, Houston and Texas are positioned to lead the uh, energy transition because of the many technologies we build and because of our expertise in this area. Today's discussion will help us understand the clean energy workforce that is needed today and in the future. It'll help us uh, really examine uh, new clean ener energy technologies as they are developed and implemented, such as carbon utilization and, and storage and hydrogen. We have a great panel to discuss this uh, these trends and the opportunities in the clean energy workforce of the future. First, it's my honor to introduce and welcome to Houston, Lady Idos from the U.S. Department of Energy. She currently serves as Deputy Director and Head of the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility within DOE's Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. In this role, Lady Idos develops and leads DOE's strategy to strengthen and integrate diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility within talent processes and culture. Lady also serves as DOE's senior designee or agency co-lead for the following efforts. The White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, executive order with the uh, White House Domestic Policy Council, and an executive order on gender equity with the White House Gender Policy Council. Lady, welcome to Houston. We're very pleased that you're joining us today, and thank you for joining us today. Second, I'd like to introduce Katie Maynard. She is familiar to many of you as CEO and founder of Ally Energy, Ally Energy, which she will describe. She is also an ambassador of the U.S. Department of Energy and a representative of the National Petroleum Council. Prior to founding uh, Ally Energy, Katie had global leadership roles with BP and Shell, in safety and environment during periods of financial crisis, spills, divestment, and globalization, and worked on assignments with Duke Energy, Entergy, and Enron. Welcome, Katie, and thanks for helping organize today's panel. Let's give both Lady Idos and uh, Katie a nice welcome this morning. Finally, Brian Black, who serves as director for the Upskill Houston Initiative, where he engages employer partners around the way they look at their future 
and incumbent workforce. In his role, he convenes employers and industries as they engage with educational institutions and community organizations to support and develop pipelines of skilled talent for Houston's key industries. Bryant, the work that you're doing is very important and critical. We appreciate all the work that the uh, partnership puts into this. And uh, this morning, uh, I'm excited uh, that today's panel will be moderated by my friend, Peter Beard. He's a great leader in this space. He, his contributions are certainly evident here in Houston, but they, he's been an advisor and a min and a consultant in his role to other state leaders around the state, certainly uh, helped me in my role when I was there. Uh, we're really proud that Peter uh, has accomplished so much for the region and contributed so much. He is a senior vice president of regional workforce development for the Greater Houston Partnership. Before I turn it over to Peter for today's discussion, I'd like to turn it over to the Department of Energy's Lady Idos, who will share some of DOE's clean energy priorities. Lady, good morning. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, my name is Lady Edos, and I'll be providing an overview of the Clean Energy Corps. And uh, before I tell you all about it, we're gonna roll a clip from our Secretary of Energy. Hello, I'm Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, and I want you to join the Department of Energy's Clean Energy Corps. The bipartisan infrastructure law puts DOE at the heart of President Biden's plan to build back better with clean energy. And it means the biggest investment in the Department of Energy history, $62 billion to build out clean energy and to lower costs for American families and to create millions of jobs and to tackle the climate crisis. We are launching the Clean Energy Corps to get it all done. We're recruiting more than 1,000 brilliant, diverse energy leaders from the private sector, from nonprofits, and from local governments. We want people from every pocket of America and every community. We want people who are passionate, who are driven, who are ready to work hard on the mission of a lifetime. We need project grant and portfolio managers to help us get these investments out the door and deploy, deploy, deploy clean energy. We need scientists, analysts, engineers, nuclear, mechanical, electrical, and civil to help us design and evaluate the electric vehicle charging networks and the nuclear reactors of the future. We need IT, cybersecurity professionals. We need people managers. We need HR professionals. We need mission support teams to keep everything running. In other words, we need you on our team. Whether you're just starting out, whether you're experienced in clean energy, or whether you're looking for something new, we want you to apply. So go to energy.gov slash clean energy core and share this video to help get the word out. Your country needs you. Your planet needs you. So join the Clean Energy Corps and let's work together to build a better America. So thank you all for uh, joining us. As you heard, uh, we are here to build a better America. And I'm just waiting for the slide to come up here. Um, I'll be talking to you a little bit today uh, about this moment, what it means, what Clean Energy Core is all about, and a little bit more about um, our discussion with our panelists today. Next slide, please. So we are in this moment. Uh, this video was made right after the bipartisan infrastructure law was signed, which uh, is giving over $62 billion in funding uh, to the DOE. And as you know, with the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, that's another 30 plus billion uh, to the Department of Energy. We also have an opportunity here to look at our Justice 40 covered programs throughout the J40 initiative and also the CHIPS Act to invest in R&D, domestic manufacturing and science uh, capabilities. Next slide, please. So what are we trying to achieve with uh, these two pieces of legislation? Uh, you can see uh, the notes here. We have uh, these slides that will be available to you all, so you can uh, take a look at this. But we are looking to lower energy bills for households and businesses, create good jobs, boost domestic manufacturing, embark on world-class next-generation energy technology demonstrations, accelerate deployment, which is what you heard from our secretary, 
for secure, reliable, clean energy, and last but not least, driving just and equitable investments in disadvantaged communities, which is the underpinning of Justice 40. Next slide, please. So we've already announced about uh, $12 billion in funding. Um, you can see the list here. It, it's, uh, it ranges from energy efficiency home upgrades, battery manufacturing, advanced nuclear reactors, carbon capture, nuclear facilities, and also supporting states as well, and looking at uh, solar manufacturing, workforce, and technology. Next slide, please. So we still have a lot of work to do. And as the video stated, we need hundreds of people at the department at this time. It's the largest investment that the Department of Energy has ever received in its history. And so we need people to help carry this out. Next slide, please. So here we are, uh, Clean Energy Core. You may have heard of the Peace Corps and AmeriCorps and Teach for America. This is the Clean Energy Corps. This is our mission to help save our planet and to have uh, US be positioned in that leadership to help lead this transition. Next slide, please. So the Clean Energy Corps, uh, we are looking for critical staff for research, development, demonstration, deployment uh, for clean energy solutions. Uh, we need to hire the staff necessary in order for us to implement Bill, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and IRA, Inflation Reduction Act. Next slide, please. So some basics here. Uh, these new hires, what will they do? They will help us support uh, what I mentioned for clean energy and our mission. Uh, most of these hires will be situated within our new office uh, for the Undersecretary of Infrastructure. So that, if you've worked with the DOE for a long time, that might not be familiar to you, and that's because it's brand new. The hires are at all levels right now. So we've gotten you know, several people very interested, and uh, they've applied through our uh, applicant system, but we're also looking for uh, mid-career and also senior because that's, these are the folks that are gonna help us build these teams. So you know, your networks, think about the senior folks, think about mid-career folks that wanna contribute, you know, uh, put in their service uh, for, uh, for federal service and uh, help us with building these teams. Um, the hires will uh, be utilizing direct hire authority uh, because that's uh, stipulated in um, our legislation and, and also what we're uh, trying to do. And it allows hires to move faster and more easily than the traditional career hiring pathway. So if you've ever tried to apply for a job on uh, USA Jobs, you know that it, it can feel like a black hole, or at least that's what we've been told. And so we were trying to make it easier, piloting some new things, including a technology called Lever for an applicant tracking system so that we can get these hires in quicker. Um, the career hires will be a mix of permanent positions, uh, term positions, um, and also flexible for hybrid or remote opportunities. So we can be, some of the folks here in Houston can take advantage of these jobs. Next slide, please. So here we are, we need a team of people ready to capitalize um, on this moment. Um, we have an opportunity to really infuse the government with diverse, talented, and driven workforce that you know, is, is mission driven. We want to leverage the opportunities to bring in new public servants that have never served in the federal government before, are thinking about a career change, or want to explore uh, new opportunities. So again, we're using uh, quick hiring and also uh, DEIA-informed interview and selection process. So we're also training our interviewers, for example, and our hiring managers on mitigating implicit bias, taking a look at resumes in a fair way, and just giving people a fair opportunity uh, to compete. So here we are uh, infusing DOE with the best lessons from all of you, uh, private sector as well as the public sector. Next slide, please. Here are the hiring offices um, that I wanted to share with you. So. Uh, the, we have the Office of the Undersecretary for Infrastructure. But within that, we, we have uh, these offices for clean energy demonstrations. We have Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains. Um, and we also have a grid deployment office. In addition, across the board, we have our state and community energy programs, loan programs office, which a lot of you are familiar with. We have a joint office with the Department of Transportation for EVs. Um, we also have the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, 
energy efficiency and renewable energy, as well as our various field sites. So these are the offices that are looking to hire. So if you have contacts in these offices, if you've made these relationships over time, you can reach out to them and learn more about um, these opportunities as well. Next slide, please. So key hires. Um, we have several hires, as you heard from the secretary. Uh, it, it runs the gamut from engineers all the way to human resources, to IT, to portfolio managers, and so on. The key hires we're looking for right now are project officers uh, for the day-to-day technology-focused um, uh, projects and you know, trying to make sure that the billions of dollars invested in these local governments and private sector are on time, on task, and on budget. So really trying to make sure that you know, these projects are uh, on, uh, uh, in line and, and, and compliance. Also looking at stakeholder engagement, we need to be engaging with our communities um, every step of the way, um, looking at uh, businesses, industry, community groups, and also uh, making sure that communities are aware of the work that's happening in their communities. Workforce development, um, near and dear to my heart, as well as Peter's um, and Katie's as well, but program staff helping to ensure that we have the workforce necessary so that we can uh, scale with these uh, clean energy positions. And finally, program managers, um, skilled people leaders. You may know them in your networks as well. Um, we're looking for them to help us with our uh, demonstration and deployment. Next slide, please. So here are some, this is a little bit hard to read with the, with the green and the white, but uh, here are some key hires um, in leadership. Um, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but we're looking at weatherization, we're looking at external affairs, we're looking at uh, uh, civil uh, nuclear credit program manager and so on. So, so as you can tell at, at this juncture, uh, there are some key hires that we need to make. And with all of you, uh, knowing uh, some uh, senior level uh, folks and even uh, mid-level, um, hoping that we can get the word out so we can help fill these uh, key positions. Next slide, please. So next steps, uh, I believe this is my last slide. Um, we need your help uh, to help us uh, fill these key roles. You probably know people uh, that will be great in um, helping us um, with uh, this key challenge uh, for uh, Clean Energy Corps and our mission. Uh, we uh, are asking for your help to reach out to key candidates directly. Uh, you can uh, direct them to this website. So it's energy.gov forward slash Clean Energy Corps, one word. They can submit their resume, and uh, hopefully, it will take us uh, or will take them through a very quick hiring process through Lever. So those are my slides. Um, I'll turn it over to our moderator here, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide you with a briefing on this. Thank you, lady. And <laughs> I'm going to throw a little change up into this, um, but. I want to connect what Lady was talking about to kind of the conversation that's going to evolve in just a second, which is, as you saw, there are probably billions of dollars of investment that will create new jobs going forward, which don't quite exist yet. So, you know, the staff, the Department of Energy, is this a good way to think about it? The staff the Department of Energy is looking for is necessary to deploy that capital that's going to be critical for some of the local jobs that, that will exist in the future. But obviously there are some jobs that exist today. So I just want to give you the opportunity to kind of make that bridge because that's kind of critical to get that capital out for those new jobs. Is that a good way to think mm. about it? Yeah, and so you're thinking about um, also just the jobs that exist today and how to sort of get them ready for yeah. the, the, the clean energy jobs of the future. So we've been talking a lot about this and uh, there's really a, a couple of key areas um, that we really need to talk about. So the first one is identifying what those jobs are or what they could potentially be. Um, we shared a little bit with you um, earlier about what they could be. But it's interesting because you, you know think you think clean energy jobs and you, you you don't necessarily think of HR you don't think of IT you don't think of these other sort of you know mission support folks but to us that's clean energy jobs that's that's what you know it, it's a sort of a broad definition but in thinking about the the workforce of today uh, when identifying the jobs that we need you know runs the gamut we also want to think about the transferable skills you know, what is, it, what is it that folks are doing now that can be transferred over to these uh, jobs of the future? And when you think about, you know, in 
used to be in, in HR as well for myself. Uh, when you think about the sort of, you know, the workforce that you have now, upskilling them to the level that you need, what's, what's the gap, right? And that's where you need the trainings, right? The certifications, upskilling, reskilling. I mean, you see, you see that here um, as well and sort of um, a model um, here in Houston. And so we really need to identify who are those key partners in helping us with these trainings. Uh, th there seems to be a, a lot of public-private partnerships going on. Uh, we have community colleges um, that are really uh, committed to uh, clean energy as well. Uh, looking at how to, you know, Lone Star yesterday, they were talking about their program and being able to certify uh, their, their people and really remove, like lowering those barriers to entry, right? You don't need like a four year degree. How can you finish up a program in a shorter amount of time so that we can get folks out there? So is one of the roles you had kind of as a priority was workforce development. And I suspect, given what you just said, it's to help identify those gaps and the kinds of programming that would be necessary for that. Yes, and, and we're also asking for, you know, the folks who are submitting proposals to do the same yeah. thing, right? So we're, we're trying to do that as well, uh, trying to give people the resources that we know about and at the same time, uh, you know, empower the folks who are submitting proposals to do the same thing so that we can scale. So let's get into kind of the, the, the conversation, which is, we throw out terms like clean energy and green jobs and clean energy jobs and energy transition jobs. Let's kind of baseline what all of that is. So let's kind of engage in a conversation with the th three of you related to kind of what are we talking about? Go ahead, Katie. Well, I, so I think it's a great question because I get it all the time. What is a clean energy job? I don't know if anyone saw on the slide, but the Office of Fossil Management is hiring. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I think we need to get away from semantics. And as my friend uh, Kay McCall and I like to say, get on with it. It is, uh, I think, I think there, there's some complexity to what this transition looks like, but from a workforce perspective, as everyone knows in this room, this is the energy capital of the world. Texas leads in both, in both spaces, in renewables and in oil and gas. And so our workforce is, is prime. I get phone calls every day from companies that want you know, to attract and develop and retain people from this region. So I think there's a huge opportunity. Uh, when I saw the, the number of jobs, I actually uh, applied. I did not get a job. Um, I have two jobs. I, I get I don't get paid for with the, the Department of Energy right now, but I went through the process just, just to see how you know, easy it would be given that you know, it's the federal government and we don't always make it uh, simple, right? But it's a very easy process and I think it's important that we reframe our mind around what clean energy is. Nobody, nobody wants to see um, our climate continue to cause, cause challenges. We've all acknowledged that it's a challenge. It's a huge economic opportunity and there are lots of, of jobs available. So I see the fossil industry very much a part of the clean energy core and the clean energy revolution. Similar to Katie, the way I like to think about it is you have your, maybe a, somebody in West Texas on, on a, working on an oil well. Um, the lifeline of how that becomes a cleaner energy job might be a little bit longer. But you also have a pipeline accountant in Houston or somebody in IT um, who that transition to what could be considered, I guess, a clean job is probably a little bit shorter. But they're all evolving. And this isn't something where we're going to all be driving on a hybrid or a hybrid um, hoverboard in two years. We're going to be transitioning gradually. These things change over time. And all of these skill sets that we have right here in Houston that have evolved over the last 70 years of us becoming this energy capital are going to be critical, not just to our region, but to the nation making this transition. And the, and the investment that the, um, the Department of Energy is making right now, as, as you saw on Lady Slides, uh, is going to be a big part of that. And only somebody like Houston who has these skill sets already in place is going to be able to make that really materialize. Which also sounds, I mean, in many respects, what I think each of you have said is a lot of the jobs today will have an element of clean energy attached to them. And we've got to figure out the upskilling piece of that. Is, is, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So we might think about these more as hybrids. Is that kind of how you're thinking about it, Lainey? Yeah, and I, and I would also say too, just you know, sort of stepping back a little bit and thinking about what we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, many of you have heard the term Justice 40, but it may still be like, what, what does that mean? What is that all about? Where did that come from? And so just, you know, trying to educate ourselves too a little bit around that. Uh, it does come from Executive Order 14008, which is tackling the climate crisis. And, you know, at a high level, uh, trying to take a look at, you know, leading our clean energy revolution, uh, making sure that we are carbon pollution uh, free power sector by 2035, but also puts us on a path to net zero economy by 2050. And to the extent in which there is that Justice 40 layer on top of it, uh, we want to take a look at this to be just and equitable. And so the 40% of overall benefits of certain federal investments going to uh, disadvantaged communities, we had to define what all of that meant. You know, what do we mean by disadvantaged community? What do we mean uh, by benefits? And what do we mean by uh, federal investments? And so we have these fact sheets as well uh, to help folks kind of understand that. And when we think about uh, clean energy jobs and just th these terminologies, you know, trying to think about what are they helping us achieve and is it going to reduce harm? And that's the Justice 40 layer, uh, reducing harm to our communities and reducing harm to our planet. Which is also about building resiliency in mm -hmm. many respects, which is why this broader category of green jobs includes you know, water and other environmental pieces to it, but not necessarily clean energy. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was trying to get into that, that broader thing. But I, it also raises a, a question, particularly for Houston, as we think about the kinds of jobs that are going to exist. Some of these clean energy jobs are gonna be localized to the communities mm -hmm. that, are, that have EV stations and solar on residential, and all of that takes place more locally, and we also will, so we'll have that, but we'll also have, in many respects, to this point, because we are the energy capital of the world, the innovation that our energy companies and, and our universities are doing it are gonna create things that are particular to Houston. Mm -hmm. And so wanted to kind of tease that out a little bit to see what people's perspectives were on that. Well, yesterday we had a great opportunity. We took a Metro hybrid bus. Uh, the electric fleet is not ready yet, but coming. And had a chance to see communities in action here in Houston. Um, so we were in the Sunnyside area, uh, had a chance to drive by there, and then also uh, met with Lone Star. And we also had a chance to look at the Bethune project, which is taking a school and redeveloping that area into a workforce development center for that community. And I, I have to tell you what's exciting about it is seeing the colleges embracing the training and the, the skills, the things that we're gonna need to build. You know, I often say, I believe that this transformation, while it's gonna obviously happen with time, mm -hmm. is the single largest opportunity at scale um, for diversity, equity, and inclusion. If we want you know, to achieve a more diverse and just workforce, our energy economy is, a, is no better, it's, it's a great place to start, right? So when we were walking into those communities and hearing about the EV you know, maintenance program, I know that HCC has a resilience center, which I haven't seen yet, but I'm excited about. There are a lot of these places across the city and across the region that are doing things to build those skills for the future. But by the same token, those who have been in large corporations, right, looking for opportunities, moving into clean energy, there are lots and lots of opportunities to, to take those skills, as you've seen a lot of those skill sets were, were mentioned. So I, I look at Houston, and it, it's, it was timely that we went yesterday to see the different communities to see in action, really, where do we have an opportunity to bring folks into this transition, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, to follow up on that, I think, the diversification, not just of the, the, the human capital, but of the, the needs that it's gonna to take to make this a success. Um, you know, some of you in the room have probably heard me talk about this a lot, because I talk about it a lot. The geography of Houston is a, is a blessing and a curse at times, but it's also, I think it's good, what could make this possible over time, these localized partnerships with our colleges, with our universities, with our, our employers who have specific 
uh, specific needs and specific skill sets. I think, to Katie's point, that's what can really make these kind of specific areas just really grow and materialize as these, um, as the hybrid diversified jobs continue to evolve over time. So as we think about it, I mean, it, 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 that's, I think, the key point that we should come out of this. There are jobs today that will change. There'll be new jobs that get created as the technologies and innovation begin to occur. And unfortunately, some jobs may go away, but the, within that life cycle, there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. So, and I want to come back to this upskilling thing, because I think mm -hmm. that's one of the things that you know, we as a country, and in many respects, some employers aren't thinking about the long-term ROI of upskilling their, their existing workforce. Because these are folks that have already figured out how to show up on time, know the culture, and the gap to kind of get them to the next level versus losing them to somebody else is a worthwhile investment. So let's spend a little bit of time on that, which is the, role, the importance of upskilling in light of this new jobs, Jobs will change and jobs will go away. Yeah, um, one of the things that you know I think about is you know what are what are un other industries sort of doing in terms of uh, transition, and you know I I, I think about uh, the the time I spent um, in healthcare as well um, before uh, federal sector, and they have programs called Talent Bridge, where they take uh, the folks uh, in their existing roles. And because of automation, some of those jobs started to kind of go away. So we're thinking about this in terms of, okay, these are the individuals who are going to be affected by this. We don't want to do massive layoffs, but we have these opportunities for them to step into these roles. And so they've created sort of internal company training programs so that they could slot into these new opportunities. So we can learn from sort of different models here and in terms of, you know, however you want to, you know, sort of define it, either upskilling or reskilling, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's 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 an opportunity for us to ask folks what is it they're interested in doing, given the sort of opportunities that exist uh, currently. So for us, uh, you know, in sort of model that I've seen outside of energy, uh, you know, I've seen it be successful and that they're engaging uh, the workforce as well to help uh, sort of craft a path for their future. And I think that's one of the things we should be thinking about is how are we gonna signal to the individual? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we think about this as a supply chain challenge, which is employers have the skills and know the skills they need in their workforce. They need to communicate it to a bunch of stakeholders that develop that. But we also have to activate the individuals, whether it's in the already in the workforce or the future workforce, to know these are pathways that make sense to pursue. So what should we be thinking about in that space? Well, I, first of all, I want to say if I had a dollar for every phone call I get from a talent manager or a HR leader, and some of them are in the room that say, I need people and I need them now, you know, I, I'd be a rich woman. Because I think that we absolutely need to look at workforce planning mm -hmm. and workforce development as a marathon. We got to look at it from a generational perspective, not a quarter to quarter perspective or even a year to year perspective. Um, there are a lot of really new technologies that are coming into play. And I think where we have we've not done well, at least in the past, is the boom bust mentality, right? That that you know creates jobs, then we go back. We need to be looking at what are those broad skills and take those broad skills, make sure that we're deploying those skills right into um, into the workforce. The other thing I think we need to do is we need to be using a technology in a, in a better way. Maybe we could, you know, um, keep some of this, you know, um, uh, data, for instance, you know, uh, look at how we can track, right, skill sets and people and the life cycle, you know, of, of jobs. The third thing I would say is, is I think a lot of this is, is about engagement. We've spent the last two years behind Zoom meetings. I think there's a real fear about, and it's, it's acknowledgeable, it's a real fear in the field. You know, I've talked to folks in the field, what, what's my job gonna look like? What skills do I need, right? Um, I think this just requires what we're doing here today, which is having conversations uh, eye to eye, uh, not Zoom to Zoom, right? Um, talking with people about you know, what those plans look like. But then, once we've got those plans, using technology 
you know, to, to, to broadcast those plans, make people aware, right, or what those potential uh, pathways are, so. So I, I'm gonna have, I have another question, but I'm gonna let you all ponder out here questions you might have for the panel, because I'm gonna come to you next to see if there are any questions. But, you know, Brian, I know you've thought about this, because one of the organizations you serve on the board of thinks about how do you help individuals see pathways particularly on the future workforce, not necessarily kind of the incumbent workforce. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I think we need to be honest, like to Katie's point about the incumbent workforce and making sure that these legacy skill sets are um, brought into this whole opportunity. But yeah, for this new generation, we also need to make sure that they're aware of what skill sets are applicable to new careers and just evolving colleges need to continue to evolve those offerings with the help of employers partnering with employers to get to get an understanding of exactly what it takes to do these jobs not just from a like tactical standpoint but from a getting into the office and understanding what a real job looks like um, and employers can be the ones to really make that a reality uh, partnering in any way possible uh, it, it really has an impact on its ISDs, colleges, to understand what those partnerships can look like and it makes them uh, tangible for teachers, advisors, administration, uh, to just actually understand on how jobs are evolving and how everything's changing. Because uh, let's, uh, let's all be honest as well, the pandemic really accelerated a lot of job change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So questions from the audience? And once again, I'll repeat it if, yeah, Barbara. No, just ask it and I'll repeat it. So I think the question, Barbara, just so I make sure that the folks in the, the, the virtual hear it, is automation technologies are driving efficiency and are changing jobs and some are becoming more commoditized. And how are we thinking about continuing to upskill the workforce so that they're using that technology? Is that a kind of where you were going? So part of it's just the transition from carbon to other things, and then how are we trying to drive that? Yeah, I can speak a little bit on this sort of, you know, the, the thoughts around workforce and trying to sync that up. I think there needs to be sort of, you know, these intentional programs. You know, we've seen um, a couple of models now, even, even here, here at Lone Star, around apprenticeships, internships, and mentorships. And so how can industry, for example, partner with community colleges, and also think about uh, an opportunity for them uh, to shadow you know, some opportunities to kind of get exposed, uh, and to have that sort of uh, you know, mentor uh, that can help them through. Uh, what can uh, companies do to set that up internally for you know, the transition to happen so that it's a, so as you mentioned, it's, 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 it's seamless, right, and, 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 and it's in sync. So I think just thinking about these programs um, and just sort of the, the transition I saw that I mentioned earlier with um, automation, you know, that was a very kind of, you know, high touch uh, approach. It wasn't like, okay, here are the jobs, good luck, go apply for them. You know, we really sought out like the workers that were going to be impacted and worked with them for like a year or more <laughs> to say like, here's what's happening, here's what's coming, here is the series of courses that we're going to be offering you so that you're prepared to compete 
for these opportunities. So I think it's making sure that people are sort of job ready, so to speak, and that they're, you know, they're ready to compete. Uh, I think that's sort of the gap that we need to identify is how do we get them to that point where they can apply for these opportunities and at what level. Um, and so if you're thinking about entry level and moving people into a new space, you know, uh, trying to connect those dots. And quite frankly, if there wasn't a place for them in the company, how can we reach out and sort of connect them outward? So there was a, like a career coaching component within the company to kind of do that. And so it's gonna take some innovation, it's gonna take some creativity, but it has to make sense for your business. And I think to, to this point, Barbara, also, there are some analogies we should be looking at where technology and other things have disrupted businesses. AT&T is a great example of winning, going from line workers to you know, a fully, you know, much more tech, and they created an upskilling program in their own way to kind of upskill their incumbent workforce, and I think their investment was a billion dollars because of the ROI to it. And so I think those are some of the things, and we know there are other industries, whether it's you know, newspapers and other things, where there's just been disruption, where we're gonna have to figure out those pieces. And it also raises a thing that I think we have to also be extremely cognizant of, that business operates at a, usually a different speed than higher ed and education and community-based organizations. And so we've gotta begin thinking about what agility looks like. So how does that begin to th play out? Well, I was, I was going to build on a, a point that you had made that kind of came to mind, and that was, um, you know, one of the things I noticed a couple of years ago were industry engineers, people with skills in the fossil fuel industry leaving to get into technology, but not necessarily leaving to go to technology and not do anything in energy. Mm -hmm. We are starting to see the Microsofts, obviously Microsofts, AWS, Googles, right, who have bases where energy energy is. I think we need to also look at how do we take those tech companies, the energy piece, and, and deliver it to you know, the community college system, right? How do we start um, you know, sh showing and, and you know, giving those skills, those digital skills that are necessary um, you know, for some of the jobs that are, that are coming in the future? So I wanted to, to build upon your, uh, your, your point. Other questions before I kind of, yeah, yeah go ahead. So, Hold on, we've got a mic coming for you. On the ground, steel toes, hard hats, workforce, right? Just normal people who work. And you're talking about upskilling. Time to dollars. Mm -hmm. Because if they're not in the workforce and they're not working, they're not making money, mm -hmm. they're not investing, they're struggling to get by, and therefore they're going to take whatever job they've got to have to get going. Mm -hmm. So in your upskilling piece, mm -hmm. if you put it in the employer's hat, is he gonna give time mm -hmm. for them to do the upskilling while they're still earning, doing whatever it is they're doing? So I'm working in Midland. Mm -hmm. I work 12 hours a day, 10 days straight, four days off. Mm -hmm. Most of the guys I know are working 14 to 16 hours a day, 14 days in a row, seven days off. When they go home, mm -hmm. they don't wanna think about work, and they're probably not gonna be upskilling because they've got other things they do. So a lot of those guys are, in the case we were looking at yesterday, innovating. They're building their own side businesses on their days off. Mm -hmm. So how do you get them involved in this process mm -hmm. so that then they're moving forward in the new skill sets while they're developing their own side business? And then as things move along, they can take that up. The other uh, thing I've seen is that the, <clears throat> the field workers are hitting a double change. The digital transformation of the energy sector is decreasing the workforce exponentially. When I started in 2011, probably seven workers on an oil rig. Today we're at four. Mm -hmm. They don't break those rigs down to move them to the next oil, to the next well pad. They march that rig over and they drill another one and they march the rig over and they drill another one because they're moving the rig stationary where it's at <clears throat> so those transportation companies aren't moving uh, rigs from place to place as often. Um, and so then you have an earning potential. Mm -hmm. Median income in the Permian basis is 83,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Those guys make it by lots of hours and hard work. 
But when you say, hey, we've got a green energy job that pays $25 an hour, he's taking a pay cut, substantial one, mm -hmm. which affects his lifestyle mm -hmm. and his family. So those are the pieces of that I was talking about. No, they're helpful. Comments? Well, I, was, I think that ties into Barbara's question as well, which is as commoditization continues to you know, decrease the prices of oil, what does that mean for investment in people? And I think one way to really look at that and address it is, this is on the employer as well as the folks you're talking about getting trained. What programs are you putting in place? How are you thinking about being proactive about hiring and training as opposed to being reactive, which is often difficult because everybody right now is being a little bit reactive in, in hiring. If you're investing in people, investing in your workforce, and thinking about who you're bringing on and how you're potentially investing in them in the long term, I think you're going to see less of that. And this that might be a little bit of a uh, optimistic view on things, but I really honestly think if you are investing in people, and, and get, this gets back to what Katie said about te how technology is impacting everything either. The job, the, the job postings that our people are finding out there are super narrow. So sometimes you're automatically narrowing your applicant pool to the point where you're always trying to find that perfect candidate, but where it, in, in the long run, you're just you're kind of chasing your tail a little bit. But so, all of that to say, I think that uh, investing in talent is really going to help uh, solve a lot of these issues in the long term. And I hope everyone heard what Daryl said, which is as a person in the workforce, mm -hmm. okay, employers, when you invest in your workforce and you play the marathon and not the race to get, you know, talent, those are going to be the workforces where people want to work, right? Those are going to be the companies where you want to work. And I get it. When you're small, it's harder. I'm a small business. It's very, very hard to, you know, find good talent, cultivate talent over time. The larger companies tend to have more, you know, capacity to do that. But this is also where I will urge all of you. We, we have a joint venture culture. We have a competitor-competitor culture. We need to start thinking about our workforce together, mm -hmm. okay? And I don't mean just in the fossil industry. I mean the energy industry. We need to really start looking at how are we going right to, to attract, develop, and retain. Um, one of the reasons why I became an ambassador to the USDOE is because we see in America this is a national security item. We have to have right people to deploy to continue to make and create, you know, uh, the energy that we need. So I. I I'm begging all of the employers in the room and on the line, listen to this workforce. They want to be a part, but start looking at who you can partner with. Be creative in how we're gonna solve this, this talent challenge because we can't keep going at it in different directions. You really need to start coming together more. And you would say, well, but that's my competitive advantage. I get it. And safety was a competitive advantage, and we came together on safety and environment rights. So we need to come together on people because we are going to be short. If the federal government is short, and we're all short, um, we've got a, a huge opportunity ahead of us. And I think, too, just this discussion, uh, so thank you, Daryl, for your comment, and it's good to see you again. Uh, but it, it, this also highlights just the need for stakeholder engagement and community engagement. I mean, these are the conversations that we all need to be having and need to be hearing so that you know we're we're you know over here on one side and industries over there and communities over here and we're all separated and we can't solve this by ourselves right we can't silo ourselves we have to engage with the communities that are impacted so even you know at, at the at the DOE we talk about this concept called place based research if you are going to be doing research at a particular location you have to engage with those communities there inc including rural and tribal communities so it's really important to talk to the people who are already there if you are you know looking uh, to to do work if you are setting up a new business if you're trying to hire people you have to engage with your communities and i think this is a great start or at least a continuation of uh, conversations that we're having. And if you don't have stakeholder engagement or community engagement people within your companies that are employed, it's something to consider. It's really important to do so. And I think what underlies, I think, Daryl's point is, you know, certainly the pandemic pulled forward the transition from this industrial economy to a 
knowledge-based, tech-enabled economy, which is going to disrupt our workforce in very different ways, and, and employers are going to have folks on their balance sheet, and they're going to have folks on their expense statements, where they're renting them to, to do that, unfortunately. But it's going to disrupt kind of how employers decide what their talent needs are, and I think we've got to be sensitive to, I think, the point Daryl was making. How are we helping to prepare both the existing workforce and the future workforce that you're going to confront either gig jobs or temp jobs or you know we're going to share workers across in you know across employers because sometimes someone's up and sometimes someone's down and we're going to have to build a workforce as well and so you know when i think about it we either build it we rent it we buy it or we borrow it and so in many respects you know we've got to build the workforce and buying talent on the spot market is, is extremely expensive to do, and that, which is why we need to kind of get to this point. So as we think about that, and let's think about, I think to your point, lady, how are we helping the individuals and communities understand the opportunity? And this will be kind of our closeout to like, we can get the employers organized, but we also need to be sensitive to, you know, the individual worker and the folks in the community. And so we need to understand them to figure out how to build those pathways. So this is really how do we build those pathways from the other side on the, you know. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start. I, you know, yesterday was incredibly educational for me, uh, but I hadn't been out in a while. And I, I had, it was, I was my first time on a Metro bus. But my, my point being that we got to get out and we got to start talking to people. I really believe that. Uh, I think we're going to probably go to Midland next. I told the DOA we might have to do a little Texas tour, right? But I think we need to have these conversations and we need to look at places where we can convene, you know, and talk about these things. When it, when I look at it from the perspective of the worker, um, people want to be a part of this. Um, the last thing I would add is we need to move away from employee value proposition to industry value proposition, okay? Um, we've got a crisis. Uh, crisis is not to be wasted. So uh, instead of us focusing on the past, we really need to focus on what is this energy transformation going to do for the individual. It's a bigger, it's a bigger, uh, bigger topic and a bigger thing for all of us to be a part of. Yeah, uh, I, similar to that, I would say we, we we need to not try to fit a square peg into a round hole. Uh, and make and realize that a lot of the younger generation does want to participate in this transition um, that is going to occur. So uh, just be honest with ourselves about exactly what this is going to look like and who's going to be involved and what their goals are um, from a personal and from a, a company standpoint. So uh, and I think also make sure we realize that this isn't a zero-sum game where it's either the government is going to get these jobs or industry is going to get these jobs. Government getting these jobs needs, to, hopefully there's you know, multiple jobs in the industry for every one job you see on the government side. And I think that's what, what these investments hopefully can be in the long run. And Katie mentioned, you know, value proposition and thinking about, you know, just, just our building the talent pipeline and thinking about education and our young people. How are we exposing them to this at an earlier age? We talked a lot about education yesterday, uh, which was a really great conversation. And you know, just having the opportunity for young people to really understand the energy system, how they can think about their future, how they can think about jobs, and giving them at that age your, our why, right? And thinking about us as, you know, our value proposition and thinking that thinking about them as our future workforce. And so there's sort of all levels here. There's the people who need to work right now, uh, who need jobs right now. And then there's also just the future that we have at hand, knowing that we're going to be bringing people in and how do we expose people at an early age uh, to this industry, uh, demonstrate our why, demonstrate our value proposition, and be an industry of choice and be an employer of choice. So that's going to be up to us to be able to do that. Which I guess gets to the final piece to this, which is how do we get past the negative perception the current energy industry has? We need to get on with it. I'm sorry. I mean, I have, I, I say that just because I see, I, I have my foot in kind of two worlds, right? 
we need to start working more closely together. And I also think by bringing government and the private sector together to really start looking at how we're going to work, you know, together on this is really important, which is why I think uh, the you, you guys made the trip. So. Final comments? Panel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would just add to that, uh, hands-on experiences where young people could actually um, understand what these jobs are, uh, it could probably help a lot with that perception. I think we've seen a lot of positive results when they can really see and feel a, a true, a, what these true careers are really like, I think can go a long way. I think in terms of perceptions, you know, it's not gonna happen overnight but it's going to be you know, consistent messaging about who you are, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve. And if you're thinking about the talent, really going out to those communities and looking at the untapped you know, sources of talent, right? We're thinking about diverse communities, we're thinking about right, people with disabilities, veterans, you know, all of these sort of untapped sources. Um, and even uh, you know, one of uh, our executive orders, 14035, for diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, talks about one of the priorities is giving opportunities to those who are formerly incarcerated. So you know, we think about the workforce at large and really thinking about untapped sources of talent and making sure we're giving opportunities to those folks and letting them know that we're open for business and this is why they should join us. So I wanna thank you, lady, and your team for coming down and visiting Houston. I hope we get to see you again. Katie, it's always a pleasure to spend time with you. And Brian, you know, it's always a pleasure to kind of have you on the panel and share your insights. So once again, I wanna thank various folks uh, here. You know, obviously our sponsors uh, that help provide the Upskill Works Forum series. Uh, and a big thank you to the audience here today for coming out and spending some time with us. Um, and then what, you know, certainly the folks online. Um, really, uh, as we finalize this, we have one last thing to share with you, which is a closing video. So thank you and have a great day.